I'm Mary Harville, President and CEO of the Kentucky Lottery Corporation. We are so proud to partner with Simmons College of Kentucky for this virtual lecture series celebrating Black History Month. We appreciate the opportunity to help bring this lecture series to you. Today, we know Kentucky's most deserving students are counting on us and our mission of fueling imagination and funding education is more important now than ever. Welcome back to RISE, a four-part Black History Month educational series presented by Simmons College of Kentucky and the Kentucky Lottery. In 1887, our school's namesake, the second president of Simmons College of Kentucky, William J. Simmons, released a literary work entitled Men of Mark, Eminent, Progressive, and Rising. This book was a collection of short biographies of 178 prominent African-American men in an effort to highlight the best and brightest of black society. This week, we will be highlighting the stories of three men of mark, all with ties to Simmons College of Kentucky. Their determination to succeed, despite the many obstacles thrown their way, has cemented them a spot in our school's history, America's history. The saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. Here, how a pastor turned educator, an opera singer, and a son whose legacy nearly eclipsed his father's, blazingly set the path. the government was prepared to begin educating the four million slaves who were released from slavery with no skills, no education. Uh, only five percent of the emancipated population was literate. Before the federal government took up the task of educating this group, it was the churches because without an education, they were just a group of dispossessed people who had no way of navigating life, no way of getting the resources they needed in order to live a quality of life. So the churches started the schools first and then the federal government. After the Civil War, you find African Americans who understood the importance and the value of education. And quite often there was a strong relationship between the church and the school. And it would start before what we, we would call the college level. If you go to many uh, communities, you will see that the church, that church building was also used as the school. Four months after um, Lee surrendered to Grant in Appomattox Courthouse, the former slaves in this state came together and formed the General Association. First Kentucky, then the second one was to be established was in Alabama, and they patterned themselves after uh, Kentucky's Black Baptist Association. Now the reason why they were established was because they saw the value of an education, the importance of educating the newly freed slaves. It's a little bit of a generalization, but there will be two types. There will be land-grant institutions. Focus of these schools will be more upon vocational education, uh, industrial education. And then the second type, the private schools, will be the ones that will focus more so upon what we would call the liberal arts. The pressure was on all black colleges to pattern themselves after Hampton Institute, which was an industrial 
agricultural domestic science institution. The best way to think about that issue is Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois, two contemporaries. Both of them agree that majority of African Americans needed vocational education. They would agree. Where they seemed to disagree was about that top 10%. Booker T. Washington was a born a slave, and he would say a cotton farmer did not need to know how to speak French. They did not need the liberal arts. They needed to know how to maybe grow more cotton and to make more money. So you find that he put more emphasis upon business and that's the way he looked at the world. His contemporary was W.B. Du Bois. Du Bois talked about that 10%. He called it the talented 10. Those would be the ones that would be your doctors, to be your lawyers. Those would be the ones that would get the liberal arts education. And then in 1879, uh, Simmons College of Kentucky opened its doors with the first president, uh, Elijah P. Mars. And he became the first president of Simmons. But um, to show you how selfless he was and how he was only driven by the desire to have a great school, he stepped aside in order to bring in the giftedness and intelligence of uh, uh, William J. Simmons. William J. Simmons was known as one of the great orators of his day. At Simmons College of Kentucky, we have a quote in which uh, Dr. Simmons, and I'm paraphrasing him, we will pass down our stellar history to unborn generations so that they will climb the mountains of difficulty, scale the cliffs of prejudice, and hide their faces in among the stars. I mean, th that's oratory. I mean, he was considered the preeminent educator of the 19th century. Uh, William J. Simmons was the first black pastor in the state of Kentucky who had a, an earned degree from Howard University. And Howard would later honor him and give him an honorary doctorate degree. A, he had a great acquaintance with with the great Frederick Douglass, who in my opinion is probably one of the greatest leaders in American history. And just to think that the greatest, most influential person of the 19th century, the most traveled man of the 19th century, nobody traveled more than Frederick Douglass, was a close colleague of William J. Simmons. Simmons University is probably one of the few black institutions that was named for a black man. So he set the trajectory for Simmons, and there were two primary goals that he had. Goal number one was to create a black professional class, which they did. The black middle class in Kentucky was trained at Simmons. That's the only place they could go. So that was his first goal. Uh, his second goal was to create an institution that was black governed. So it was one of the few institutions, in fact, it was the only institution in America that had a law school, medical school, liberal arts college. The entire faculty was black. Uh, the entire governance was black. The president was black. So it was the personification of black empowerment. And that is why black institutions are so vitally important because black institutions help keep the story of the black experience in this country alive. Let's go back in time to the 1930s. Here, the original cast of Porgy and Bess, with co-star Ann Brown as Bess. In 1935, George Gershwin personally selected Robert Todd Duncan would become the very first Porgy. Very much a leader in the Harlem Renaissance along with Paul Robeson and William Steele, William Grant Steele and 
Marion Anderson and all the other giants. And Duncan was one of the leading figures. I was still a student at the Juilliard School of Music in my last year. And I read in the New York newspaper that George Cushman was writing an opera and would be on the lookout for talented black singers. And uh, I brought an accompanist who was also a student at the school and uh, went down and I sang. Born in Baltimore, Maryland, Brown began her musical training at Morgan State University, the state's largest HBCU. Here's a picture of George Gershwin. There is Todd Duncan. Without question, Duncan should have been living the American dream. But these were the 1930s and 40s, and the American nightmare of racism was real. And then hundreds of people backstage asking for your autograph, and you cannot go in the restaurant to eat or to take care of your needs physically next door. You have the money, you have the clothes, you have everything else but you're the wrong color, so you can't go in. It is frustrating to say the least. In, in 1940, when he returned to his adopted hometown, now Washington, D.C., to perform, he insisted that his people could come to the production. It was a segregated audience. So he actually won out and the first artist to bring about this integrated audience. And so I got in a great deal of trouble with my own union and with my own board and with my own producers. I became a rebel, you know, a rebel Negro because I wouldn't appear. In 1936, the National Theater hosted its first integrated performance. While simply trying to make beautiful music, this Simmons alumnus would also make civil rights history. Years later, Duncan would shatter another color barrier when he became the first African American to sing with the New York City Opera. African-American, the connection, the inter, inter, intertwines with the spirit. The sea stood still, now ain't that a witness for my Lord? Ain't that a witness for my Lord? Ain't that a witness for my Lord? My soul is a witness for my Lord. You talk about Todd Duncan, you speak about Louis Armstrong, or you talk about Duke Ellington. It's, it's all rooted in the Negro spiritual. Uh, Duncan said that the spirituals are everything that he is. His, his, his idea was that if an artist uh, was ambitious and flexible, they can and to be able to sing anywhere from grand opera to uh, be, to musical comedy. heard Roland Haynes, his biggest influence at age 17, here in the city of Louisville and changed his life. He said he knew then that he wanted to be a singer and then he enrolled in uh, State University here in Louisville. 
uh, that later changed to Simmons University and graduated in 1922. Uh, he later taught at Simmons University, I, I learned from 1925 to 1929, taught music in, in, in his 90s. The first part of his life was his career, but the second part of his life, he spent time teaching. Well, you know, it's a certain kind of dignity too that comes with being a black artist, a certain kind of pride. It's a tradition uh, that we, you know, if you look at any pictures of jazz musicians, any pictures of these guys like Todd Duncan or William Grant Steele or Paul Robeson, you know, Marian Anderson, Florence Price, you know, Langston Hughes, these are beyond their beyond category. And it really is about black excellence because in spite of this American nightmare that they had to struggle and endure you know, of segregation, um, they felt that if you worked hard and, and was able to uh, study your craft and be excellent, excellence will overcome. A deep uh, commitment in what you know and that every hour of the day, every day in the week, is a testimony to who you are and what you're doing. Why well, nobody can tell us that, not even prejudice. In 1951, the University of Louisville integrated all of the black professors that they had. I think they had 19 black professors uh, with advanced degrees and tenure, had been at municipal for years. They fired all of the black professors. And through negotiations, they agreed to retain just one of them. C.H. explained to me that they agreed to choose by lot to see which one would come over to the university. And they got together in this building, apparently, and they drew straws, and Charles Parrish, Jr. got the short straw. So it was mere, merely by chance that he became the first black faculty member in any white institution in the South. It's a bittersweet story. It's really outrageous. Uh, important to understand his career trajectory. Uh, Charles Parrish Jr. was born in 1899 and uh, in Louisville and uh, he graduated from Central High School in 1916, which means he was an accelerated student. And from there, he went on to Howard University and finished a bachelor's degree in mathematics. And um, in 1920, graduated from there. And then very shortly, went off to Columbia University in New York City and finished a master's degree in, in sociology. And what's distinctive about that, of course, is that his father, in the meantime, took over Simmons College and became the president. Uh, if you look back at his dad, uh, Parrish Sr., uh, the stuff I've read indicates that Perry Sr.'s idea for the solution of the of black people's problems in America, and we're talking a period from the 1880s when the school was founded all the way up to when he died, his focus was on improving the quality of black lives and improving the quality of their schooling, their health care, in effect, 
rather than working on breaking down barriers of white society, he felt that where his energies needed to go was to improving the situation for black people. And an example of which was he started a school for a residential facility for poor or abandoned children. I have the suspicion that C.H. picked up some of that orientation from his dad. Rather than push the boundaries with white society, work on our own problems and improve the welfare and the life quality of our people. By which time he was a faculty member at what became Louisville Municipal College. The Simmons University, as it was then known, uh, went into near financial bankruptcy because of the depression and they even gave up this campus uh, and moved to buildings on the west side of town through the depression and only when Dr. Cosby came on a scene were they able apparently to reacquire these properties and move back to their historic. The biographer of Simmons is a, is a professor, a uh, pretty brilliant PhD professor named Lawrence Williams. I call you the Apostle Paul of Simmons history. He wrote a book on the, on the parishes. In fact, um, without um, your preservation of Simmons history, there's a great chance that the fullness of the Simmons story would have been lost. So you are, you, God used you to be the custodian and the preserver and the scribe. In the last chapter of the book, he talks about our church because in 1996, our church purchased as surplus property, the old Simmons College campus. What happened was the University of Louisville, when they integrated in 1951, they transferred the property to the Jefferson County Public School Board. Well, the General Association was changing. They contact me and ask would I be interested in the trustees in becoming the president of Simmons. I become president in 2005 and then it dawns on me. The pastor of St. Stephen Church is in custodianship of Simmons. And the president of Simmons wants what the pastor of St. Stephen Church is in custodianship of. So one day, I'll never forget it, because I was there, I'm telling you, I was there. The president of Simmons had a meeting with the pastor of St. Stephen Baptist Church. They said, the pastor said to the president, you can have it back. And so in 2007, 77 years after we lost it, the sons and daughters of the slaves had a grand parade back to the original campus. It was the greatest homecoming, perhaps than any black institution has ever had. And one of the great days of my life was when I could call David Jones Sr. and say to David, we fulfilled the mission.
When then, newly appointed Simmons president, accompanied by local businessman Charlie Johnson, visited David Jones Sr., Dr. Kevin Cosby informed him of his new appointment and praised the school as a shining example poised to meet the needs of students, kids from Louisville's West End. Dr. Cosby went on sharing his vision and then presented a request to Jones that would require a measure of hope and faith. Although the visit did not make international headlines, in retrospect, it was one of the most important decisions ever made with respect to impacting African-American achievement in Kentucky. The meeting ended with two resolutions. One of Dr. Cosby moving the school from its present status to become a fully accredited institution of higher learning with the full liberal arts degree program and also one of David Jones Sr. A donation for $1 million. And in doing so, he did more than just write a check. He wrote his the 13th president of Simmons College of Kentucky kept his promise. And under his visionary direction, Simmons College of Kentucky was granted accreditation by the Association of Biblical Higher Education in 2014. And in 2015, it was officially designated as the nation's 107th HBCU. The visionary gesture of Jones Sr. represents a prime opportunity to focus on what we know about philanthropic inclusion and to move the discussion beyond ideological and partisan debates. This is rather crucial given the data of two categories, demographics and dollars, located in one of the nation's most economically impoverished neighborhoods. The presence of Simmons will be an economic lift to the entire community. Historically, HBCUs have provided a stable and nurturing environment for those most at risk of not entering or completing college. And nearly half of the enrollment at Simmons College are first-generation college students. For more than 150 years, HBCUs have been providing diverse learning environments from students to faculty to administration, ensuring every student's pathway to success in HBCU tuition rates average almost 30% less than comparable institutions. Recognized in 2019 as the most affordable HBCU in the nation, Simmons has become the envy of neighboring cities, not fortunate to have such a gem. And while students across America have accumulated one $1.3 trillion in college loans, Simmons students graduate with no student debt, which could dramatically narrow the racial wealth gap. Given all this data, there is no better time for an honest discussion about philanthropic inclusion. While HBCUs are in need of corporate donors, financial gifts to schools like Simmons is not charity. It's an investment. In 2005, David Jones Sr. gave in faith and hope. In 2020, your decision doesn't take either. Comparably, there is no greater return on investment like an investment at Simmons College. A commitment accompanied by a list of guarantees. Just to mention a few, Simmons has one of the lower student-teacher ratios in the state, which virtually guarantees that students will get the attention and support they need to reach their highest potential. Secondly, the affordability aspect alone is attracting students from across the nation to attend Simmons College. And finally, there are guaranteed federal dollars coming to our city that will increase as our enrollment increases. Now, given their proven track record of influencing the academic success of African Americans, which directly impacts the success of the entire city now more than ever, greater investment is needed in institutions like Simmons College of Kentucky. Develop leaders. You represent who I am, who I have been, and who I can be. Change agents. Keeping the spirit of activism and engagement alive and well. That ignite their communities. The community of achievement, one that will demand much of you. And change the world. We set out to do it and to do it well. We produce 80% of all black doctors and dentists. We generate the black middle class. Strong enough to support the weight of whatever you could dream. We provide a sense of belonging, a celebration of our unique culture. That is the magic of this place. Almost anything can happen here. 
We are the pipeline that produced many of America's black first. But its mission has been to ensure those firsts were not the last. The nation's VP elect is a product of this distinct heritage. When you attend an HBCU, there is nothing you can't do. We are America's historically black colleges and universities. And we are proud to be Louisville's only HBCU, Simmons College of Kentucky. Maybe you have been chosen for such a time as this. Visit SimmonsCollegeKY.edu or text ADMIT to 55444. We are Louisville's HBCU.